Hello, my name is Robin Mitchell and welcome to this episode for Electromaker. In today's video, we will be looking at uBlock's latest ThingStream service that provides cellular-based IoT projects with a secure network focused on reducing energy consumption, which translates to cellular IoT devices that can last much, much longer. Now, for those who are more interested in the hardware side of things, you can jump ahead to chapter four, getting started with the hardware. And for those who want to see the results from the power measurements I took, you can jump ahead to chapter nine, comparing HTTP to MQTT. For those who want to learn more about uBlocks and what their new MQTT SN service is, then stick around and prepare to be amazed. Now, before we dive into the hardware and software provided by uBlocks, we first need to know who is uBlocks. Well, uBlocks is a leading provider of chips and modules for various applications, similar to a uh, famous building block toy, <coughs> Lego, oh sorry. Anyway, their product portfolio includes positioning and radio communication chips and modules, all of which are perfect for simplifying IoT products and building complex systems. However, uBlocks doesn't stop at hardware they also have introduced a range of new software services to further assist IoT projects. And in this video, we will be taking a closer look at their ThingStream service for cellular IoT devices, what it is, and why it's the obvious choice for any new IoT project. Now, in traditional computing devices, like computers and servers, power consumption when connecting to the internet is not a major concern. This is because these devices almost always have some kind of stable, reliable power supply, such as the mains. Furthermore, because of this permanent connection, wireless communication, which is historically power hungry, is easy to implement from an energy point of view. However, in the case of IoT devices, this is far from the case as these devices can often be dependent on tiny batteries, solar panels, or energy harvesters, every joule of energy must be accounted for. Getting energy out of a solar panel is like trying to get blood out of a stone. Shining a torch on a panel is the equivalent of punching rocks. It's your blood on the rock, your energy on the panel. This means that hardware engineers need to make sure that their designs consume as little energy as possible, and I mean as little as possible. Considering that internet protocols are often complicated and that wireless communication requires a lot of energy, you can see that wireless internet communication and tiny energy sources don't exactly go together. Oh, and uh, just to make it worse, that device needs to be able to operate for extended periods of time on that battery, anywhere between six and 12 months. But it's not just the hardware that needs optimization. Software also plays a crucial role in reducing energy consumption. Methods that engineers can deploy include turning off peripherals and chips and putting devices into sleep mode. However, there's a significant area of software that has lagged behind in energy conservation, transmission protocols. Many of the protocols and connection methods used in IoT devices have been borrowed from computers, servers, and mobile phones, which have considerably more energy available. Consequently, these protocols, such as TCP IP and HTTP, are not designed to minimize connection time or optimize energy usage. Furthermore, modern connections must incorporate robust security measures to protect the device and transmitted data. No thanks to a minority of super intelligent thugs who would rather spend their time stealing Bitcoin from your grandma. This need for security further complicates the energy consumption aspect. As a result, energy staffed IoT devices have to wake up, establish a connection, perform DNS requests to determine the target availability, set up security protocols, send that data, and then close the connection. What should be a simple task of sending 12 bytes of data quickly becomes a few thousand bytes and consumes valuable CPU time. So is it all doom and gloom? Should we just give up on designing cellular IoT devices because traditional internet protocols and wireless energy consumption is just too damn high? Well, thanks to uBlocks, the answer to that is a big fat no. uBlocks solution called ThingStream consists of a cloud-based MQTT broker and a global roaming SIM card with a private access point name or APN. When used with an IoT device, 
the uBlock SIM card provides that device with a cellular connection. But unlike a traditional internet connection, where all data being transmitted routes through public servers, any data sent to and from the IoT device to the APN is entirely private. This means that when sending data to the APN, it doesn't require encryption from the device's point of view. This encryption is done by the SIM card and connection entirely hands-free. At the same time, as data transmitted across the APN is also entirely private, i.e. not exposed to the internet, there is no need for encryption at this level either. These message packets then arrive at the MQTT broker and from there can be shared across the internet or to other devices inside the APN. The result of all of this is that the number of bytes transmitted by the device is reduced from kilobytes to a handful of bytes per message. Therefore, this means that devices can wake up, connect, send a message, read data directly via the APN, and then go back to sleep, consuming far less energy than they would normally consume. Now, the beauty of this service is that it's hardware agnostic, meaning that it works seamlessly with various different IoT devices. However, for the sake of this demonstration, we will be using a uBlox device. I know that's a bit cheeky, but hey, they made the service. I think it's only fair that they get to show off their SARA R422 module. So here we have all the hardware that we're going to be using in the following experiments to demonstrate the low energy capabilities of the ThingStream service. Now the main board here is a flip and click, which comes from Micro E, and this has four different slots for four different devices using the Micro E bus as such. Now alongside the flip and click, we will also be using a piece of hardware also manufactured by Micro E, which uses the uBlock SARA R422 module. This thing can do both LTE and GNSS. Now, along with these two different boards, we also have an antenna, which will be connected to the LTE port to give us better signal strength. And we also have one of these starter kits that came from uBlox itself, which inside here contains a SIM card, which is right there that goes into the micro E module. Now, there's one thing I'd like to quickly point out, which is what this little starter pack looks like and how it opens, because quite frankly, it's the single most coolest thing I've ever seen. Oh, look at that. Now inside this, you'll have your SIM card here, and then you've got the different kind of uh, sizes there. So we're gonna use the smallest one because the smallest one connects to the module. And on the back of the SIM card will be a number, and that number is going to be important if you don't have a redemption code, which is found, whoops daisy, on the back of the module. So all we need to do is to grab our SIM card, pop it into the SIM holder on the bottom, like so, the contacts facing down, quite tricky to get it in there because it's very, very small. We're going to stick this into slot A, making sure that it points upwards like so. And then we're going to go ahead and screw in the antenna like that. And that is the module completed. Now, when it comes to powering this board, we have different options available to us. We have two micro USB B connectors at the back here and then one here. Now, while you do have two different micro USB uh, points for powering this board, you're going to want to use the one next to the barrel jack because this one also provides programming. Now, when it comes to power measurements, I'm going to be using the barrel jack because I'm going to put a one ohm resistor in series so I can measure the voltage drop across that and therefore infer the current, which tells me the power consumption. This is going to be important later because I'm going to measure the power for different types of functions of this module to demonstrate the difference between using the ThingStream service and general HTTP. So now our board is done, it's time to jump over to the uBlox website where we can log into ThingStream, create an account and see how we can get to work with this thing. So the first thing we need to do is we need to create an account on the ThingStream website. So we enter our email address and we come up with a name for our domain. In this case, I'm using something quite basic, electromaker.thingstream.io. Once we've registered, we have to go ahead and activate our account. And once the account has been activated, we then re-log into our account using the same credentials that we had before. Once logged into the portal, we can see all the different tools and features that we have available to us, including the dashboard, location services, security services, and the MQTT listener. 
Now we can't use this service until we've actually added our device. So to do that, we go to communication services, communication things, and on the top right, there's a button called add thing. Now we're going to go to the use a code section because we have that redemption code. So we click that and put in our redemption code. Once that's done, you can see that our thing has been activated and ready to use. As all of the credentials are stored in the SIM card, we don't need to copy any API keys or passwords to our code. The next step is to configure the Arduino IDE with the Things Stream library so we can program our flip and click with the necessary files to connect to the uBlock service. So to do that, we go to the left side of this window to this little arrow, which is downloads. And then under downloads, we're going to click IoT communication as a service and then click the Arduino. And from here, we need to download the C SDK Arduino library. With the Arduino IDE loaded, we now need to install the uBlocks library. So to do that, we go to sketch, include library, add zip library. Then we go to the download location and then we install it from that zip, just like that. And at last but not least, we need to install the flip and click board support into the Arduino IDE via the board manager. And to do that, we go to the board manager and we search for SAM. So what we're looking for here is the Arduino SAM boards, 32 bits ARM Cortex M3. Once this has been done, restart your Arduino IDE. So in our first demonstration, we're going to look at the basic publish example whereby a simple message is sent from the flip and click board to the thing stream service. To load this example, the first thing we need to do is go under examples and then scroll right down to the bottom where we can see the thing stream examples and then flip and click and then thing stream basic publish. Now it's very important that you don't click thing stream basic publish that's not under the flip and click sub menu as this is the wrong version of the project. Now that the code is loaded, all we have to do is compile and download this to the board. One of the great things about using the ThingStream SIM card is that all of the authentication and credentials are on the SIM card, so we don't actually have to make any adjustments to the code whatsoever. So to download this code to your board, the first thing we have to do is make sure that the correct board is selected. So we go to board, Arduino SAM boards and click the Arduino do programming port. Then we select the port by going to COM12 in this case, but that may be different depending on your system. Then we click verify. And once the code is compiled, we then go ahead and download it to the board. Once the program has been downloaded, we need to open up the serial monitor so we can interface with the flip and click board. The first option that we're presented with is asking which clickboard that we're using. In this case, we're using option B, the LTE IoT 7 click. The second option that the menu asks for is which slot that we've actually inserted our clickboard into. And in this case, it's slot A. Once selected, the program will run automatically, upload the message and then shut down. We can also use the MQTT listener in the ThingStream platform to listen for these messages. So we go ahead and select the device that we want to listen from. We restart the program. And if we look at the MQTT window, we can see that the message has appeared. Furthermore, we can explore more details about the device that's connected and the data that's been going to and from it via the traffic logs. Here, we can see all the different messages going to and from the device. So if we select one, we can view the decoded payload. And in this case, we can see our hello basic published message. Now in this second example, we're going to have a look at flows. Now this is quite a complex part of the ThingStream service, so we're only going to lightly touch on it. But simply put, flows are programs that the ThingStream service can run when it receives messages and can basically make it do certain events. Now in this case, we're going to be running the very basic ThingStream low power send and receive flow. Once the flow has been designed, it has to be deployed to a device so that it knows which device is going to take data from a flow and receive from a flow. As we can see, flows can be quite complex, doing all kinds of different actions, whether it's reading data, writing data, and connecting to remote servers. We have things like conditional statements, we have things like program flow, events, and even other services such as Amazon Web Services. This means that you can pretty much make the ThingStream service do anything you want it to do, depending on the messages received from the device. And just like the previous demonstration, we'll go to examples, ThingStream's flip and click, and then go for the ThingStream low power send and receive example. We will compile that, download it to the board, and then run the application. Just like before, we have to enter the menu options to tell the program what board we're using and what slot it's in, and the program will automatically send the message and close down. 
using the MQTT listener, we can see that the message has been successfully received. For our third and final demonstration, we will compare the energy consumption between HTTP and the ThingStream service. To measure the power from this board, I'm going to be using the barrel jack and a 1 ohm metal film resistor with a 1% tolerance. By placing this resistor in series with the ground and then measuring the voltage across it, we can infer the current going through that resistor and therefore infer the power consumption. The software that we're going to be using to test this example has been specially written for me by the uBlocks team and all this does is simply send the same hello published message to a random PHP server using the HTTP protocols. We then run the example and measure the current via my oscilloscope. Finally, we rerun the first demonstration and also measure that current consumption on the oscilloscope and compare the two. This capture shows the current consumption when using the ThingStream service and this one when using the HTTP request. When comparing the two, the top being the ThingStream current consumption and the bottom being the HTTP current consumption, it looks like that both of these events occur over the same period of time. However, the thing stream actually occurs in half the amount of time, so really it should be squashed by about 50%. If we zoom into where the message is actually being sent, we can see that there's a lot more activity in the HTTP version than there is in the thing stream version. As such, it becomes quite clear that there's a lot more current consumption going on when using HTTP than when using the thing stream service. Furthermore, you can also see that there's a lot more current spikes even after the message has been sent because HTTP needs to wait for a response from the server. If the ThingStream version was required to also send a message to a remote server, such as a web server, then it could do so via the flows, and this would eliminate the additional energy consumption in the IoT device. As we conclude our exploration of uBlock's IoT communication as a service, it's crucial to understand that cellular communication can be complex and traditional internet protocols may not be suitable for energy constrained IoT devices. uBlock's private APN solution combined with a lightweight MQTT-SM protocol mitigates these challenges. It reduces complexity, eliminates the need for additional encryption layers and offers a seamless IoT cellular service all while saving a whole load of energy. If you're interested in exploring this innovative solution further, we highly recommend visiting the uBlocks website, where you can find both hardware and software solutions for any cellular project you can think of. But don't forget, they also have other interesting features, including GNSS and short range radio. Finally, if you want to support the work we do here at Electromaker, considering heading over to our online store where you can find everything you could possibly need for your next project. Thank you for watching. This is Robin Mitchell, signing off.